Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans, and I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. On today's program, John Russell presents a new everyday grammar lesson. This week, he talks about adjective clauses that describe reasons. We close our show with the next episode of *The Making of a Nation*. But first, here is Alice Bryant. A small group of scientists. Carried machetes through the Amazon rainforest. They cut through dense plant life as the mid-morning temperature rose above 38 Celsius. The group of men and women cut into trees. They dug into the soil and painted words across tree parts. It's destructive. But we only do it for a few trees," said Carlos Roberto Sanqueta. He is a forestry engineer professor at the Federal University of Paraná in Brazil. Sanqueta led the week-long research trip in November. The team of scientists included a botanist, agronomist, biologist. And other forestry engineers. They took several samples of plants, both living and dead. The Brazilian researchers are studying how much carbon different parts of the world's largest rainforest can store. Such storage can help remove carbon, a greenhouse gas, from the atmosphere. Greenhouse gases trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere. The scientists are working in a part of the forest about 90 kilometers from Porto Velho in Rondônia State. We need to understand what is the role that forests play," said Sanqueta, a member of the UN Intergovernmental. Panel on Climate Change. The panel is the world's top group of climate science experts. Sanqueta said it is important to know how much carbon the Amazon's trees take in when unharmed, and how much they can release when destroyed. In the rainforest, it is hard work in hot, wet conditions. Filled with insects, and it involves use of several tools for cutting, digging, and measuring. Raoni Hajau specializes in environmental management at the Federal University at Minas Gerais. He is not involved with Sanqueta's team, but said. These are hardworking people willing to get their hands dirty. The Brazilian team is just one group among hundreds of researchers seeking to measure carbon in the Amazon rainforest. The massive forest covers more than six million square kilometers in nine countries. Some research seeks only. To measure carbon in trees, but Sanqueta says his team's effort is all inclusive. It measures carbon in soil, underbrush, and dying plant matter. In addition, his team is studying carbon in reforested areas. This can offer information needed to push. For reforestation efforts, carbon dioxide or CO2 
is the most widespread of the greenhouse gases. Trees take it in from the atmosphere and store it as carbon. But the process also works the other way. When trees are cut down or burned, the wood releases CO2 back into the atmosphere. In Brazil, parts of the Amazon are often cut to make room for agriculture and grassland for cows. Deforestation in the Amazon has sped up under President Jair Bolsonaro. Since he took office in 2019, at least 825 million tons of CO2 have been released from deforestation in the Brazilian Amazon. That is more than is released by all U.S. passenger cars in a year. The office of Brazilian Vice President Hamilton Maro leads the government's Amazon rainforest policy. In a statement, the office said the rise in deforestation happened before the current leadership. It also said the government has been working hard to end destructive mining and lumber trafficking. Central to dealing with the climate threat is the need to improve carbon measuring methods for more exact readings. Everyone wants this information, said Alexis Bastus, project leader of the nonprofit Teja Study Center. The Brazilian organization provides financial support and several scientists to Sanqueta's team, which began its current line of research in 2016. Early findings show that planting a mix of Amazon species leads to better carbon storage than letting the area regrow naturally. But the findings also suggest that nothing is better than leaving forests untouched. One hectare of untouched Hondonia forest holds an average 176 tons of carbon based on Sanqueta's examination of Brazilian science ministry numbers. By comparison, a replanted hectare of forest, after 10 years, holds about 44 tons, and soy farms hold an average of only 2 tons. After the work, the samples were taken back to the laboratory. There, the team dried and weighed them before burning them. This lets them measure how much carbon is contained. The team measured samples from 20 pieces of land in November. The final goal is 100 pieces of land by later in 2021. I'm Alice Bryant. Imagine you want to answer a why question. For example, someone asks you, Why did you go to the train station? Your answer might use an adjective clause. If you do not know what that term means, do not worry. We will explain the idea in today's report. In this Everyday Grammar, we will explore adjective clauses that describe reasons. But first, we need to begin with a few definitions. What are clauses, anyway? Clauses are groups of words that have a subject and a predicate. 
Consider this example. English grammar is fun. English grammar is the subject. Is fun is the predicate. Sometimes clauses are not complete sentences. Sometimes they play a part in a longer, more complex sentence. This is where we come to adjective clauses, also called relative clauses. Adjective clauses are clauses that act like an adjective. They describe or give additional information about nouns. Consider this example. This is the book that I told you about. The adjective clause is that I told you about. It describes or gives more information about the noun book. Adjective clauses have many uses. They can describe nouns that refer to time, place, or reason. When describing reasons. Americans often use adjective clauses immediately after the noun "reason." English speakers commonly use words such as "why" or "that" to begin these clauses, but sometimes they do not use any words at all. One common structure is the noun "reason" followed by an adjective clause that begins with the word. Why? Imagine a situation in which beginning science students try to find out why their experiment had unusual results. Perhaps one of them finds that the measurement tools have not been cleaned. He or she might say, "This may be the reason why our results were unusual." The adjective clause begins with the word "why" immediately after the noun "reason." In a second common structure, there are no special words that begin the adjective clause after the word "reason." Consider the question you heard at the beginning of this report: Why did you go to the train station? You could say. The only reason I went there was to meet my friend. Or, the reason I went to the train station was to meet my friend. Popular music also has many examples of this structure. Consider these words from Shania Twain. You might hear a third structure, the noun "reason" followed by an adjective clause. Beginning with the word that. Think back to our example about the train station. Why did you go to the train station? You could say, the reason that I went there was to meet my friend. You will hear English speakers use all of the structures that we talked about today. Sometimes you will hear them use two or more of the structures that we have talked about. In the same song, speech, or discussion, let's listen to a few words from Callum Scott's song "You Are the Reason." Note that Scott does not use a special word between the word "reason" and the words "I'm losing my sleep." Let's listen to a few more words from Scott's song. You might be wondering why Scott used the word "that" in this example. In the other example, after all, he did not use any special word at all. There are a few possible explanations. The songwriter could have used "that" because it sounded better, or possibly the songwriter did not want to repeat the exact same grammatical structure. Throughout the song, the next time you listen to music or shows in English, listen for how speakers describe reasons. Take note of when they use the word "reason" and when they use adjective clauses to describe it. With time and practice, you will use adjective clauses with great ease. I'm John Russell.
Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. Larry West and Tony Riggs continue the story of President Woodrow Wilson. In 1917, Europe was at war. It was the conflict known as World War I. After three years of fighting, Europe's lands were filled with the sights and sounds of death. But still, the armies of the Allies and the Central Powers continued to fight. The United States had tried to keep out of the European conflict. It declared its neutrality. In the end, however, neutrality was impossible. Germany was facing starvation because of a British naval blockade. To break the blockade, German submarines attacked any ship that sailed to Europe. That included ships from neutral nations, like the United States. The German submarines sank several American ships. Many innocent people were killed. German submarine attacks finally forced the United States into the war. It joined the Allies, Britain, France, and Russia. Like most Americans, President Wilson did not want war, but he had no choice. Sadly, he asked Congress for a declaration of war. Congress approved the declaration on April 6, 1917. It was not long before American soldiers reached the European continent. They marched in a parade through the streets of Paris. The people of France gave them a wild welcome. They cheered the young Americans. They threw flowers at the soldiers and kissed them. The Americans marched to the burial place of the Marquis de Lafayette. Lafayette was the French military leader who had come to America's aid during its war of independence from Britain. The United States wanted to repay France for its help more than a hundred years earlier. An American army officer made a speech at the tomb. He said, Lafayette, we are here. And so the Americans were there. They were ready to fight in the bloodiest war the world had ever known. Week by week, more American troops arrived. By October 1917, the American army in Europe totaled 100,000 men. The leader of that army was General John J. Pershing. Pershing's forces were not sent directly into battle. Instead, they spent time training, building bases, and preparing supplies. Then, a small group was sent to the border between Switzerland and Germany. The Americans fought a short but bitter battle there against German forces. The Germans knew the American soldiers had not fought before. They tried to frighten the Americans by waving their knives and guns in a fierce attack. The Americans surprised the Germans. They stood and fought back successfully. Full American participation in the fighting 
did not come for several months. It came only after another event took place. That event changed the war and the history of the 20th century. It was the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. Its leader was Vladimir Lenin. The Russian Revolution began in the spring of 1917. The people of that country were tired of fighting Germany, and they were tired of their ruler, Tsar Nicholas. The Tsar was overthrown. A temporary government was established. It was headed by Alexander Kerensky. President Woodrow Wilson sent a team of American officials to Russia to help Kerensky's new government. The officials urged Russia to remain in the war. Under Kerensky, Russia did keep fighting, but it continued to suffer terrible losses. Many Russians demanded an end to the war. Lenin saw this opposition as a way to gain control of the government. So he went to the city of Petrograd. There he led the opposition to the war and to Kerensky. Night after night he spoke to big crowds. What do you get from war? he shouted. Only wounds, hunger, and death. Lenin promised peace under Bolshevik communism. Within a few months, he won control of the Petrograd Soviet. That was an organization of workers and soldiers. Kerensky's government continued to do badly in the war. More and more Russian soldiers lost hope. Many fled the army. Others stayed but they refused to fight. The end came in November 1917. Soldiers in Petrograd turned against Kerensky. Lenin ordered them to rebel, and he took control of the government within 48 hours. Russia was now a communist nation. As promised, Lenin called for peace. So Russia signed its own peace treaty with Germany. The treaty forced Russia to pay a high price for its part in the war. It had to give up a third of its farmland, half of its industry, and 90% of its coal mines. It also lost a third of its population. Still, it did not have real peace with Germany. The treaty between Russia and Germany had a powerful influence on the military situation in the rest of Europe. Now, Germany no longer had to fight an enemy on two fronts. Its eastern border was quiet suddenly. It could aim all its forces against Britain, France, and the other allies on its western border. Germany had suffered terrible losses during four years of war. Many of its soldiers had been killed. And many of its civilians had come close to starving because of the British naval blockade. Yet, Germany's leaders still hoped to win. They decided to launch a major attack. They knew they had to act quickly before the United States could send more troops to help the Allies. German military leaders decided to break through the long battle line that divided most of Central Europe. They planned to strike first at the north end of the line. British troops held that area. 
the Germans would push the British off the continent and back across the English Channel. Then they would turn all their strength on France. When France was defeated, Germany would be victorious. The campaign opened in March 1918. German forces attacked British soldiers near Amiens, France. The Germans had 6,000 pieces of artillery. The British troops fought hard, but could not stop the Germans. They were pushed back 50 kilometers. The attack stopped for about a week. Then the Germans struck again. This time, their target was Ypres, Belgium. The second attack was so successful, it seemed the Germans might push the British all the way back to the sea. The British commander, Field Marshal Douglas Haig, ordered his men not to withdraw. Haig said, There is no other course open to us but to fight it out. The British fought hard and stopped the attack. Losses on both sides were extremely high. Yet the Germans continued with their plan. Their next attack was northeast of Paris in May. This time they broke the Allied line easily and rushed toward Paris. The German army chief, General Erich Ludendorff, tried to capture the French capital without waiting to strengthen his forces. He got close enough to shell the city. The French government prepared to flee. Allied military leaders rushed more troops to the area. The new force included two big groups of American Marines. The heaviest fighting was outside Paris at a place called Bellow Wood. The American Marines were advised to prepare for a possible withdrawal. One Marine said, Withdrawal? We just got here. The Marines resisted as the Germans attacked Allied lines in Bellow Wood again and again. Then they attacked the German lines. The battle for Bellow Wood lasted three weeks. It was the most serious German offensive of the war. The Germans lost. <laughs> And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.